So today we're talking about regular expressions. To give a little context, uh, this is something that a handful of you have uh, dealt with in cleaning up your data. You've probably grabbed a, a plain text book from Project Gutenberg, and you've noticed that there are uh, special characters in there. Even something as simple as a period or a comma or a question mark um, is being caught and treated as a word based on a very, very uh, simple way of splitting your words based on spaces or white, white and return characters, right? The white space. So a few of you have jumped into, like, how do I get rid of these characters? Um, and regular expressions is one way to do it. You can just do a string.replace function. That will do it as well. But it will have different effects. If you had the word game-play with a hyphen in the middle in your text, that would become two words if uh, you did split based on uh, hyphens. It would become one word if you did a replace the, the hyphen character with, with nothing. And with regular expressions, you can capture either of these things and deal with them gracefully. Basically, it's a text processing technique that is really important, but I also will warn you at certain times can be a rabbit hole of complexity. But the you maybe will see strings of characters that look like this. Um, and it looks really weird, and you're like, what could that possibly be communicating? And today, we're going to unwrap the mystery of what all these special characters mean. So the, the most important thing to know about regular expressions it is it's all about patterns. Uh, anytime we're processing text, it's basically organized in a file. Um, and these are strings, right, as we call them in programming languages. You just say it's words or text in English. But in programming, we say strings, which are sequences of characters. Um, basically, these are represented as bytes in the file, uh, little 8-bit chunks of data, often in the ASCII codes. Or if you, depending on your encoding, it may be a Unicode larger uh, bit width for every character you encode if you're doing uh, a non-Latin language. Uh, Arabic, for example, or Japanese, any of these languages would be encoded in Unicode. Um, and regular expressions will support those, but for, for the purposes of this, we're just going to talk about ASCII characters, which is Latin, Latin letters, um, and maybe a few things with umlauts and diacritical accents on them. So strings are sequences of characters, and files are sequences of these characters or bytes, right? It's just a bunch of uh, bits lined up, saved into a, a place on your hard drive. And when you have these sequences of, of bytes or these characters, in there, there's information organized, which is basically a pattern, right? It could be a bunch of random, uh, random numbers or random bytes in this file, and you open it up, and it looks like there's nothing going on. Interesting, it's just a bunch of gibberish. That we would not, probably not call a pattern, right? But if it's a book saved as a, a file in bytes, there's going to be a lot of patterns. There's spaces between words. There's uh, commas and periods. There's new lines at certain places. And regular expressions is one way to process those different patterns of how text and, and bytes are organized. Here, let's, let's go with an example. DNA is a very intuitive example for how these patterns work. I imagine everyone in this room knows what DNA is, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is how our information, our genetic information, is organized in every cell in our body. And it's made up of these uh, base pairs uh, on opposing helices in the, the molecule. It's a very, very, very long string of essentially data um, to organize our genes. And the, there are four, uh, new, uh, I believe they're called nucleotides, um, to represent these. In, in computers, we use binary, base 2. You could think of DNA as being encoded in base 4, where there are four different molecules that, that are representing these symbols. Uh, I think it's adenoside, cytosine, tyrosine, and guana guanine, something like that. Um, we, we're just going to call them by their first letters, A, T, C, and G. It's convenient that chemists uh, came up with different initial letters for them, so we can actually uh, talk about them uh, in, in this way. So genes are basically these patterns of molecules. You may have heard that there's a bunch of junk DNA um, in, encoded in our, uh, our DNA helices. That's becoming less and less true through time. We're realizing that a lot of this junk DNA does actually encode something meaningful. But even what is not considered the, the junk DNA, what has been considered meaningful for a long time, they're called genes. They're these large, large sequences, like incredibly large sequences that encode things like, how do you build a neuron? How do you build a liver with lots of cells, including neurons? How do, you, um, how do the mo molecular mechanisms of building new bodies and new cells uh, teach, kind of pass on the information to the next one? These are all encoded in genes. 
And as, again, these genes are just patterns. They're organized data. I would consider information data organized in a way that encodes something meaningful. So let's actually look for a pattern. Here we have a strand of DNA, and we want to look for a particular pattern. In this case, we're not going to use a very, very long gene like you have, the 23 that you have, but just a sequence of three particular uh, nucleotides. So how would we find ATG in this list? Someone just described me an algorithm in English. Don't worry about programming. Just tell me how I might try to find one in this sequence. Yes. So Leslie said, search, start from the beginning, search, and try to find an A. Once you find an A, like here, see if the next letter is T, right? Then if that is actually true, try to find if the next letter is G. What if we found an A but not a T? What would we do? Keep going down the, the sequence, right? In this case, we're going to find this as the first A. Then we're going to say, oh, that is indeed a T. Great. Now, do we check if that's a G? It's not. So we keep going, and we look for the next A, right? We have to start back over at the smaller sequence, look for the next A in the list. So as we go through here, we can basically check, this is not an A, this is not an A, this is not an A. Yes, we have it. This one is, but that one is not a G, as we're looking for. Um, we find this is the next A. The T matches, the second letter. The G matches, great, we found one. That's our pattern. We found one of those. <clears throat> so, uh, so a couple of questions come up when you're matching patterns. One could be like, uh, can you find this pattern at all in the DNA, right? What's another question we could ask about finding this small sequence, this pattern in the large sequence of DNA? What if the pattern is longer than, D than DNA sample or the, the sequence is empty in, in short? Right, in those cases, you couldn't possibly match it, right? Are there any other questions? Audrey? Right, how many times does this pattern appear in the sequence is another question, right? Because you may not just look for one, but you want to know, like, uh, maybe, for example, if you're searching in your web browser, you want to see, like, how many times does this word show up on the page, right? That's a, a natural question. Google, Chrome, and Firefox will all tell you these, this information. Um, where does this occur in the sequence, right? Where's the, you could say, where's the beginning, where's the end, that sort of, um, that sort of a thing. <clears throat> Maybe you could say, what comes right before this and what comes after it? Maybe because you know that, uh, suppose you had some way of understanding the way that the, the, way that the molecule uh, is building the next uh, strip of RNA, that after this gene, something is failing right after that. It's building up uh, the next layer of the, the, uh, the next cell to a certain point, and then the ribosomes fail, or whatever it is. It's right after this. Um, there are plenty of times when you're looking for a particular word, like maybe you could search a document for make, and you want to know, is this make games? Is this make school? Is this make love? Whatever you're looking for. You want to know, like, what is the word after make, right? So there's also a difference between the idea of exact versus inexact matches. If you're searching in your browser, uh, you're doing what we call exact matches. Also, any text edit, um, uh, editing program in most computers have some sort of a find function, and it will typically find exact matches only. You type in a word, it'll tell you where it is, but you can't specify any like magic special characters. You can't say make star, where make could match anything after it, right? Uh, you could not um, maybe have a variable, no like my name, Alan, can be spelled in at least four different ways with one L or two L's, with A-L-A-N, A-L-E-N, A-L-L-A-N, A-L-L-E-N. I would have to type in four different ways to see if there are any Allens in a long roster of, of students, right? I couldn't specify, well, maybe one or two L's, and it could be an A or an E after the L's, right? This would be called an inexact match or, uh, pattern. Some people might call it a flexible pattern as well. Um, this is really important to, uh, to match things in general because you don't want to specify like all of the, like there are only four ways to spell Allen, but there are a lot of ways to write a price, uh, a, an amount of money, right? There could be all sorts of different currencies represented. You could say dollars and cents. You might have a period in there, you might not, right? So this is really the goal of what regular expressions are doing is to match these flexible or inexact patterns. It's much, much easier to match an exact pattern. You could write a program in uh, you know, a short script with maybe five or 10 lines of code that, it, that could find exact patches, uh, matches. And I encourage you to do this right after the lecture, is try to write that program 
it finds the short pattern in the long uh, uh, list of gene sequences, the long, the long gene sequence, that is a very, very common interview question. And it's something that if you don't, if it, it's not a natural to you exactly how you would structure that, you should practice it. You should um, feel confident that that's something you, should, you can write rather quickly. <clears throat> so regular expressions are for inexact patterns. Uh, and let's come up with an example of when we want to uh, find that. What about if we wanted to look for words in quotes in text? How can someone describe to me how to match these things? Any word inside quotes? Right, so what Ignat described is that you first find the opening quotation mark, and then you keep going until you find another quotation mark, and then you stop. And everything between there, including the quotation marks, is the quoted word or phrase, right? So a uh, subtlety to this that he hinted at is that it could match a word in quotes, or it could match a phrase that has a space in quotes. It could actually match many, many sentences or on multiple lines of a book if you had an, an opening quote and then somebody had made a typo and they didn't, forgot to close it, it might go to the next paragraph or something like that, right? Any thoughts or questions about this, how we might do it differently? So here's an example. And the two words we want to match are like this. Indeed, that the technique described would match these. We're looking for the, the opening quote. We'd keep going until we find the other one. But what if this uh, quote right after expressions was left off? What would we match? Right, expressions are space. Expression space are space. And then super would not get matched at all, right? So it's sensitive to these issues. Yes? Right. Depending on how your program is written, it would try to match this quote after super and keep going, and then it would reach the end of the file and not match. And hopefully it wouldn't crash. You've written your program in such a way that it would just say, that's not a match. There was, it might print a warning or something that there was an unmatched number of quotations. So, what we want to do is describe this pattern in general, not depending on strings. Adrian, did you have a thought? Are you talking about the specific characters written on this slide? Yes. Uh, good catch. So, if you notice, the quotes on the left and the quotes on the right are slightly different angles. This is what people call smart quotes, because it looks a little bit more like it's handwritten. You'll probably notice in your code, anytime you put a, parent, uh, a quotation or a, an a, a, Per, what is it called, apostrophe, it's perfectly vertical and it's not angled in any way. And that's really, really important for programming because that's how we define strings with these, like, these uh, ambiguous quotes. They're ambidextrous. They could go on the left or the right side of a string. In most text editors uh, that are meant for presentation purposes, they automatically change them to these other quotes. Sometimes you have to consider that. There are multiple different styles of quotations. There's also a different kind of an apostrophe. There's a vertical one, and there's an angled one. There's even a left one that's very uncommonly used if you did the, quoted a word with a single quotes. But the apostrophe one is often used when you, you have a contraction like can't, don't, won't, shouldn't, that sort of a thing. So it's something to be careful of. There are actually at least six different quote, like quote or apostrophe styles that you might want to capture if you were writing this program. In code, you should only ever use the vertical ones. It, your, the program probably would not run correctly and throw a syntax error if you use the other style. So it does visually appear that they're balanced, and that's because they're smart quotes. Um, yeah, so basically when we want to describe patterns to match like this in the abstract. Um, and one way to describe it in English is to match any sequence of characters that starts and ends with a quotation. So Ignat was describing check the start quote then any characters, we don't care what it is, so long as it ends with a quotation mark, right? So one way to describe the things in between the quotation marks, how would you describe it in English? What, what could occur between quotation marks? Any Unicode, any Unicode character. Did you have another thought? Content, right? Um, right, you could say letters, you could say characters. Um, you could say anything that's not a quote. That's like the one exception. You can't have a quote in there, right? Anything else goes. You could have invisible, non-printing characters. There are things in ASCII to make a bell ring and to make it like the delete key on your keyboard is encoded as an ASCII symbol. Um, so there could be funny things written in there 
and it, as long you could you might want to match those so long as it's not a quote, right? All right. So enough talk about silly examples. Let's actually solve a problem, a practical problem with regular expressions that you might encounter. One that I hinted at was prices. So imagine you had a menu like this, and you wanted to match the prices. A real world uh, example of this is uh, there was a summer academy student in Sunnyvale who was actually trying to get all sorts of restaurant information to, to display things in a uh, kind of like restaurant voting application. It wasn't quite like Yelp. It was for your friends and for group group selection. And they had a programmable API for some parts of it where they could find a list of restaurants, um, but they couldn't get the name of the restaurant correctly. So they actually had to visit um, some other website in what we call Scrape, the uh, HTML page, and look for specific things in there. You might not have an API for getting the prices of a menu, but might, you, might, you might be able to visit the restaurant's uh, website and get a menu that looks like this. Right? And then you'd want to grab the prices off this and stick it in your app or in your data for an API you're building or something like that. So what we want to do is match the prices in this menu. Can someone come up with an idea of how to do this? What indicates a price? So Josh was saying a dollar side, a number, a period, and then some other numbers, right? We're, we'll, get, we'll build up to that. Um, the first thing that would tip you off is that there's a dollar sign, right? So here are actually the, where the prices are that we mentioned. Um, I just want to point out that three of these four would be matched by what Josh said. Um, what we're going to do is start simple. And we can just build things up one at a time. Just like when you're, we're, we're building this uh, Twitter bot and we want to build things iteratively, even a small script you build, you want, to, you want to start iteratively. And because regular expressions can be quite complex, it's really important to start small and build it up one step at a time. So let's get to where Josh was describing. The first thing to look for, dollar sign, right? We can specify a pattern for regular expressions. And uh, we want to put it in a string as a quote because regular expressions are described as a sequence of characters to match a pattern. And we want a dollar sign. Does anyone have any idea why there's a backslash in this pattern? Yes, Adrian. Right, it's an escape character. The reason is that dollar sign means something very special in regular expressions world. In particular, it means match the end of a line. So it would only, get, it would only match something after the 4.25 in this, because it would be like where a new line character occurs in your file. But we don't want, we're not interested in these like end of line matchings. We just want literally a dollar sign. So if you do an escape character, it generally means literally the thing that follows this character. So if you wanted a period, you would have to do backslash period. If you wanted a um, up arrow or a square bracket, like you would find for an in, uh, array indexing, you'd actually need to do backslash square bracket. Um, what if you wanted a backslash? What? Double backslash. The first one says escape. I literally mean the thing that follows it. And the second one says, oh, backslash. Literally a backslash. Think not. We'll get to that. Um, sometimes you would have to escape, double escape things. And the reason is that, have you ever written a string that has a backslash n in it? Has anyone ever done that? Right. Many people have done this. This is a new line character. That's why it starts with an n. Um, what that does is it tells the programming language interpreter or compiler, I don't mean the two characters backslash followed by n. I mean a new line character. But you can't put one in the code because then the, it'll, your, your interpreter, your compiler will complain and say, now you have a new, uh, a new line. You didn't finish your, your quoted string, right? So this is one way of encoding special characters for the sake of the programming language. So backslash is interpreted by the programming language in a way to, as a way to um, put special characters in. But we also want sometimes these, these things encoded for the purpose of regular expressions. So you, you could do backslash, backslash, n. And that would uh, uh, essentially escape the backslash so that the regular expression is getting the symbols backslash, n. However, there's a better way to do it in Python that I did not include in these slides that you can't do in most languages. But if you put a little r in front of the single quote, it's called a raw string. And what it, it does is it tells Python, I literally mean what's in this string. Don't interpret these characters like backslash n as a new line. 
just, just make the characters backslash followed by n in this string. Uh, you'll notice in all of the regular expression docs on the Python website, uh, this R is included in front of it for regular expressions. So uh, I'll give a link to that later on, but keep that in mind that you, you, you just want the regular expression processor to interpret these symbols. So we have a dollar sign, right? What has it matched so far? It matched these four characters right in front of the prices that we're looking for, right? But we may not actually want the dollar sign. So, and we also, we need those numbers after the dollar sign to, to find the prices. So let's build it up. What would be next? What could we do? A lot of different things we would exclude, right? Comma, space, a letter, uh, an another funny special character, right? So it's easier to describe what we do want than what we don't want most of the time, but not always. So like he said, uh, like Imad said, we want either numbers or periods, right? So let's uh, go to the next step. Well, basically, we, we can refine this pattern. And one way to do it is you can say there's four of anything. Notice that there's, in most cases, there are four symbols after the price. It would match these three prices, but it would incorrectly match this one. That doesn't work very well because we get five comma O, five comma space O as the, one of the prices. So to use Imad's technique, we would use this pattern, which looks like we've already gotten pretty complicated now, right? Um, we have a dollar sign, and then this first thing in the square brackets is saying the range of digits from zero to nine. So this actually specifies 10 different characters we can match. Imad was saying numbers, right? This is saying a single digit, um, and then the plus says, I want one or more of those things. There has to be at least one, but it will match any number of them. So if there were 20 digits in a row, if it was a very large number, that would work. That would match. The thing after that is backslash period, which says literally I mean a period. Uh, none, not the special character that's interpreted by regular expressions with a dot. What about the question mark? What does that mean? Right, optional is, question mark basically means it might be there, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's one way of saying zero or one time, right? Because sometimes we have a period in three of the prices we do, but in one of them there's no, there's no period, there's no decimal point, so we don't know if it's necessarily gonna be there at all. But what if it was uh, like three dots in a row? Well, that's definitely not a price, right? We wouldn't wanna match that. So the question mark says zero or one of, these, of the symbols right before it. The plus character was saying one or more of them, right? <clears throat> so if we can match a group of uh, digits of any length, then maybe a period, then what do we want after the period? Digits again, right? Zero through nine is all, all 10 digits. And then what about the asterisk? What does that do? Adrian? Zero, Zero to many. So it's like even more, uh, a looser number of uh, matches than the plus. Plus says one or more. Asterisk says zero or more, which is like any number of things, right? So the plus, the question mark, and the asterisk are all really useful symbols. You will be using these quite often in regular expressions. The reason why we put an asterisk after the period is that if a price does not have a period, it won't have any sense, right? It won't have any pair of digits after it. You could be really specific and actually say we want to match two digits after the period, because that's typically how prices are written in the United States when we have dollars and cents. But this is a little bit more general. It would match prices in Zimbabwe where they may be like fractional, like a, a totally different uh, organization of, uh, of money or other places where there's smaller fractions. And sometimes you might occasionally see someone write a price as $2.5, right? When they mean 250. And it would match that as well. Um, does it work for this example? Does it match everything? Kaza? Why is the question mark not in front of the backslash dot? Right, $5 does not include a dot, right? It does not have a decimal or a sense after it. So these three special characters plus question mark and asterisk immediately follow a sub pattern. There's, there's three groups, uh, there's three things happening right here. There's the zero and nine group, then there's a period, and there's a zero nine group. Okay. After each of these groups, we have to specify how many times should it occur. 
If we didn't, it would match exactly once. So if we just have zero uh, bracket, zero dash nine, close bracket, that would match exactly one digit and that's it. The special symbols that immediately follow it say how many times it can match. In this case, one or more, zero or one, then zero or more. Ignat? Dollar five dot. No. Well, you tell me. Would it match? Hmm. Would it? Who thinks it would match a dollar five period at the end of a sentence? Raise your hand. Who thinks it would not? Raise your hand. Okay. Let's go through and see if it would work. If we had dollar five period at the end of a sentence. First thing we do is match the dollar sign. That would work, right? The five would match zero or nine, and it incurs at least one time, right? So the plus is satisfied. The period, does that match? Yes, it matches because it's zero or one times. And then what about at the end? Does it need digits after the period? No, the asterisk says it could happen any number of times, including zero. So it would indeed match that, and it's important to note that it would match the period. So $1.5 period, uh, this, this would all be matched, right? It wouldn't cut off before the period. So it's something to be aware of, uh, it's sensitive to, which is why it's really, really helpful that you always have example text when you're writing regular expressions, and as you iteratively build them up, you run it over and over and over again. So let's see in this text what it matches. In fact, it matches all of these. Notice it gets the $5, but not the comma, because we haven't specified that in our pattern and it'll get the 4.25 at the end of the sentence, we will not capture a period after that. Great, so it works. Is this what we wanted? We wanted to get the prices out of this menu. Someone who's shaking their head no, explain why not. This is true. That's beyond the scope of the problem we were trying to solve. We're not trying to match uh, item description with a price. Uh, that would require, require a little bit more sophistication. But we want the price. Um, I guess it wasn't fully specified, but maybe we don't want the dollar sign, right? We just want a number. We just want to know uh, 4.25 so that we can read that in and process that as a number in our application. Yes? Aha! Good work. So if we were to say, change this pattern, we don't, because we don't want the dollar sign, and we want to just find the prices. I'll also give you a shortcut. Backslash lowercase d means digit group. It's equ exactly equivalent to the square brackets uh, 0 through 9. So we could replace that. What if we just took off the dollar sign at the beginning? We said digit group one or more times, period 0, 1, digit group 0 more times. What would that match? It would get our four prices again, right? But like Ignat mentioned, it would get the two before the buttermilk pancakes. Darn, we broke it. So there's like a, a kind of a push-pull here. We matched the, the dollar sign to begin with, but we, um, and we got all the prices we wanted, but we would wanted to cut off the dollar sign character. Now that we've done that, we're matching too many things. It's a little bit too admissive of a pattern. Adrian? Strip it later. Strip it later. That's one way to do it. You could capture those prices with the dollar sign and then do a string replace function, right? String dot replace dollar sign empty string. Jacob.
Right. So there's a way in regular expressions to say, I want to match this when I'm searching for things, but it's not the information I ultimately want to pull out of this text. That's basically what Ignat was saying. And the way to do that is with, with, with what is called groups or grouping. Um, you could do the, the string replace afterwards and just strip out the dollar sign, but this is a way to do it all in one step using regular expressions. So um, basically, a group is used with parentheses, and you, you just put parentheses around something, and you say, that's the thing I want. So this is going back to the pattern that includes the dollar sign, and we're using the backslash d as the digit group, which is equivalent to 0 through 9. Right? What this does is it says, I want to match all these characters, but what's inside the parentheses is what I want to pull out and use later. So what it does is it matches all of these, and only the prices are pulled out, the, the numbers that follow the dollar sign. Got it? And uh, you can, there's, if you read the, the Python regular expression docs, you'll find out exactly how to pull out the value of this group. Any questions about how this worked? This is like a little bit of magic, but also really, really helpful in regular expressions. We could go over examples for hours and hours and hours of all the different special symbols you might use in, in regular expressions. But I encourage you to read the docs. Don't try to understand it all. There are so many different ways to do things. Um, and regular expressions is a good example of how there are like 5,322 ways to solve a problem. But it's not important that you know all of those. You just need to know one of them. And it'll generally work for your purposes. So you might try to solve it in two or three ways, but you don't need to know all the special characters and all the ways to do it. To do it. Just kind of get it done, in a sense. Um, great. We found the pattern. Um, I should also mention that regular expressions are definitely not something that exists only in Python. They exist in almost every programming language that uses any sort of strings or files and that sort of, sort of thing. Almost, uh, they all have a, some sort of module or library that you pull in. In Python, it's RE. Very short name for uh, a module. So you just say import re, and then you say, can say re.match, re.replace, re.search, uh, those sort of things. Uh, and you can read the docs about how to do it. They actually are a concept beyond programming languages. It's, uh, we might talk about it in the spring semester, something called an automaton, which is a pattern matching uh, device. And so regular expressions are a particular flavor of this automaton, but it's all built into a library, and you can use it in any any programming language. And for the most part, they're compatible between different languages. They're the same set of symbols that define things. The top 20 or 30 special symbols in regular expressions will be identical bet between almost all programming languages. A few may have a f like some really advanced features that you probably won't need to use unless you're doing something really sophisticated. And maybe like Perl 6, the latest version of Perl, will have, have this sort of thing. But um, most old versions of Perl kind of set the standard for, standard for what regular expressions looked like and how they worked and what uh, special symbols they had. So there's something called Perl Compatible Regular Expressions, PCRE. So you might sometimes see this acronym thrown around if you're reading websites about regular expressions. And it just means the common subset of regular expression stuff that almost all languages support. Any questions? Um, watch out for special characters. Oh, Josh? OK. There's three characters we use in this example. The simplest one is the question mark, because it says, mm, I don't know, maybe it's there or not. It's a question. Zero or one times is what it matches. The star, you might have used at the command line when you can specify like star.py as like any Python file that you're talking about. Star is a wildcard that means anything. So you can think of it as zero up to 17 million, or whatever large number you might need to match. The plus is everything except zero, so one or more. You can think of one plus as a little bit more than asterisk. Plus one is the way I put it in my brain. Um, I should have a number line here that shows which of the different groups of things they, they specify. So question mark, zero or one. Star, zero up to infinity. Plus one up to infinity. Does that make sense? But there, there are three different flavors of wildcards. Another question? Do they become inefficient for large data sets? So the size of the data set is like how many times it needs to check and match. But regular expression libraries are built in a really, really, really efficient way because of this 
concept I mentioned called an automaton, it can be encoded very, uh, very efficiently. And so you generally don't need to worry about the performance of the matching, only the length of your data set. The matching, no matter how complicated you get, the matching will be very quick. Uh, it's definitely going to be way, way, way faster than anything you can write by hand that solves an equivalent problem, where you're like stripping these characters and then chopping based on commas into separate strings, and then reading through and getting the dollar sign and, and like breaking apart. All of those things are going to be much slower than the regular expression library, which is like really, really optimized to process large quantities of text quickly. Good question. Any others? So special characters. I mentioned the dollar sign is matches the end of a line. The up caret matches the beginning of a line. These are also pretty useful ones that you might, that you might want sometimes. For example, if you manage to split your corpus, your set of documents, into a bunch of different sentences and put the sentences on different lines, uh, you might use the up caret to say, oh, this is the first word of a sentence. And you might want a, spe a special case whether it's capitalized or lowercase. Uh, when you're processing things. A lot of you use, uh, did a lowercase technique to kind of simplify the number of words. So for example, if united came at the beginning of a sentence or at the middle of a sentence, it would be in di like capital U, lowercase u, and you'd collapse them down into a single case. Uh, that works most of the time, but you might also consider, what about United States or United Kingdom or United Arab Emirates? These are all very specific phrases that mean something different. And you might want to consider that a separate word. Um, like, what's a uh, name that's also a word? Phil? No, that's, that starts with a P, not an F. Uh, there, there are lots of them. Help me. Max. Max is a good one. Uh, Bill. Max and Bill are both names with a capital letter or words with a lowercase letter. And if it's a lowercase letter, it's almost certainly not a name. If it's an uppercase, Probably a name, but it depends. Maybe uh, the, it occurs at the beginning of a sentence and you want to special case it or something like that. Uh, don't worry too much about it. For the purposes of our Twitter bot, you can keep it simple. If you've gotten, if you're like keeping pace with the, uh, with the, the tutorial steps, you could go into to all these kind of special cases and try to capture a little bit more about the language with the capitalization rules, but don't get lost in a rabbit hole and, and, and slow down your progress at all with that. Um, but I was mentioning that dollar, the dollar sign at end of the line, up caret, beginning of the line, could be useful if you're trying to do that. Um, there's also something called flags. Uh, you can read a little bit about them in the documentation. One f useful flag to know about, it basically changes like, the behavior of how the matching works, is, for, uh, is sometimes a, a special thing like, so the dot character is a very, very useful special character in regular expressions. It means anything. Any symbol whatsoever, doesn't matter what it is, it's going to match. So just a regular expression with a dot in it will match any one character. Dot uh, question mark will match a single character or none. Dot star will match anything you could ever possibly write whatsoever. There's nothing that it won't match. So dot star is sometimes used when you're saying, oh, well, I need, maybe I want dollar sign, the character, dot star, comma. And that's going to match everything that happens between those two things. But in our example here, if you did dollar sign, dot star, comma, it would indeed match 1.75 or 2.50 or 4.25 or, or the 5 here. It would match these things. But it might be what we call greedy. And it might try to grab as much stuff as possible in between. So it could match the first dollar sign after coffee, and then go all the way to the comma after five and match the characters in between. That's what we call greedy. It's taking as much as it can with the dot star match. Okay? So there's a flag in regular expressions to say greedy or not greedy. Do you want to expand as much as possible or the least amount that satisfies this pattern? Any questions about that? The greedy technique or not? That's probably the most useful flag that I've used in practice. Uh, to, you, have, you have to turn it on or off. You have to check what the default is. Did you have a thought? OK, so what Ignat has described is a different technique to solve the same problem. There are like 17 other ways you could solve this exact problem here. And it would match perfectly uh, in the same way on this text. He was talking about a negative look behind really special case thing. 
Sometimes you would want that. Uh, in this case, this definitely solves the problem. You don't need to worry about this advanced feature for the purpose of this one little problem. It's just two different ways to do it. So, what it, okay, there, um, when you match something, there's one set of characters that you get in the result that matched everything that's in the quotes of the pattern. There's another one you can specify that say, I just want what's in the group. You have to look in the docs, but it'll probably be dollar sign one in the result is how you say group number one, because you could actually specify multiple groups. You could say, I want the number before the period as one group, and the number after the period as a, a different group. And so you can capture dollars and cents separately. And then later on, when you're trying to grab the information out of that, dollar sign one would get the dollars. Dollar sign two is the second group, would get the cents, if it exists. Does that make sense? So you can match multiple groups and, just in, and, and use them as you want. Regular expressions are good for finding and matching things. They're also good for, for changing a string. Suppose somebody, just for the sake of the example we've already dealt with, suppose you wanted to switch the dollars and cents sign. Some of you may have done a puzzle that dealt with this, dollars and cents uh, switching. Um, you could use this matching technique to grab the two groups, and then in the replacement string, which is the thing if you use the re.replace function, it's going to put, you can do dollar sign two, after the question, uh, you could do an actual literal dollar sign symbol, then put the, f the second group of cents, then put an actual period symbol, then the first group with dollars. And it would switch those, and you could like immediately swap the prices in a, in a, a menu like this in a, and spit out a new string or text file. So you can use these groups to move things around if you want, or you can just grab the data from one of them and say, I'm interested in the dollars only and not the cents. I'm just going to round, round all the prices. Or in this case, we're grabbing dollars, period, cents, and then you can interpret that as a floating point number. Uh, I think there was one more thing to mention. Um, the flags, we got that. The special characters, the wild cards that I mentioned, the, the question mark, the, the plus sign, and the asterisk are really useful. The dot is sometimes useful. Uh, the caret and dollar sign are for beginning and end of line. There are a handful of other things. There's also a, a couple of uh, general purpose groupings uh, backslash D is for digits, backslash W is for words, or in other words, like letters and things that commonly occur inside of words. So consider, look in the docs for these handful of special things like that. You can also capitalize the letter, backslash uppercase D actually says anything that's not a digit. Backslash uppercase W is anything that's not a word. A, a, anything that's not a character that it would occur in a word. Uh, look at those. Those are probably the most useful. Backslash S is for spacing with like white space. Space character, new line, carriage return, which sadly is two different characters in ASCII code. Um, and a tab character is the other kind of white space that you might see. Uh, read the docs. I don't want to teach you all the special characters and go through a thousand examples. I want you to start using them as, uh, as soon as you're collecting uh, data. Even if you just have one book downloaded right now, uh, you can play around with them just for a little while um, and see if you can match something that you're, that you're interested in. The reason why we want to, to, we want to talk about regular expressions is that they're generally useful for doing any sort of uh, text processing stuff. And you'll notice that especially as you get a book in certain formats, there'll be all these funny characters. There may be like chapter titles with equals signs underlining things in a, in a Gutenberg book that's meant to be formatting and you want to strip these things out and not have those like word-like things in your corpus, right? In your set of, uh, set of words. You don't want to put them in your histogram. So you want to clean out all those characters. So there's a, there's a page in the tutorial that talks about text processing and cleanup. That's what this lecture is meant to help you focus on and understand. Do not get caught up and spend days working on this. Uh, computational linguistics could go down a, a rabbit hole of like weeks and weeks and weeks of like making, uh, matching the, the words correctly. Uh, just spend a couple hours working with this and get comfortable and familiar with it. If you're, ha if you're struggling, let me know. Um, really just do things like get rid of uh, punctuation. That's like a good basic uh, exercise in this that will help your Twitter bot be better, but you won't spend too much time on. So regular expression uh, how-to guide and Python tutorial is really useful. The RE library will have all the different functions you need. 
but you probably only need two or three of them, which is like match, search, and replace. And uh, this Dive into Python book has a whole chapter on regular expressions. Finally, I want to point out and show you this visualizer of this, that's uh, kind of helpful. I, it's a really good place to experiment and, and start building up your regular expressions and see what it's going to match. Really quick, I want to show you, this is the final pattern we ended up with. Uh, it's the final link in the resources page of the slides. And what it does, it visualizes what you're matching here. We have backslash dollar sign, which finds the actual dollar sign character. And then notice the parentheses are boxed as a group. And it shows a digit. And the little arrow shows that you can loop around, right? We start at the black dot on the left. We end at the, the, the dot on the right. And we're looping through the digit character. That means any number of times. Then we could go through the period. That's like one occurrence. We could go around it on this path, right? That's zero occurrences. We could loop through the digit. Notice that the loops are different on the second digit group because we could pass over it and skip entirely. So a path from the left dot to the right dot is one possible way to match a string. And as I change the regular expression in this window, you'll see what if we made this plus no longer a plus? Bam, there's no longer a loop around this digit, right? We have to find the digit, and it, it will occur exactly one time, right? What happens if, let me put that back, what happens if we forgot the backslash before the period? Any character, and that might happen zero more times, right? And if I change the question mark to an asterisk, could be any character any number of times. So this will match really anything between two digits. Uh, check out this website, play around with it as you're doing it, and remember that whatever comes out of this window, uh, you put inside a raw string in Python. R, quote, your pattern, end quote. And if, you have, if you're totally confused about something, please let me know. I'll be happy to try to work through some examples with you, um, help you understand later today. But Captain, isn't it so much easier just to write Python code that finds and replaces stuff? Why would I ever use this ugliness? What happens if I just use Python code? Two reasons. When you get to a million words, it's going to be super slow and make your, run, your script run forever. Third reason, these are really, really useful in practice. Anytime uh, you're searching in files for a particular thing you're looking for, there's also a command line tool called grep that's really, really useful. If you're like, I know I had some code that had a function like this in it. Do you want to open up like your last 300 files of code that you wrote over the past several years? No. You probably just want to search for, like, I know I had a function called something like this. And you can specify a couple of guesses in a regular expression. Type grep this in your code folder, all files, and you could find it in a split second. Um, really useful tool we'll talk about later when we cover Unix utilities. How likely is it to show up in my six-month internship where I see source code that has this, or I need to write one, or else my boss will yell at me? Super, super, super likely that you're going to see this in code somewhere else. Also fairly likely that you'll have to write something in your first six months of work. Almost guaranteed that you'll have to write some regular expressions in your first two or three years of work. Almost guaranteed. If you're not writing regular expressions every once in a great while, you're probably not doing anything with le like letters and characters and files ever. You might be doing quantitative analysis on the stock market or something. Uh, any questions? Check out this website. It's really cool.